In 1983, the third Superman movie exploded onto the big screen with Superman 3, which once again sees the great Christopher Reeve return as the Man of Steel. This time around, Richard Pryor stars as computer programmer Gus Gorman, who gets manipulated by sinister industrialist Ross Webster, played by Robert Vaughn, to use his computer skills to cause chaos, so Webster can have even more power and control. And one chunk of synthetic kryptonite later, and Superman becomes evil. In fact, he's so bad, he doesn't even change his tights. I mean, look at his costume. It starts to look really dark and dirty. Seriously, is this Superman or Stinky Man. Superman must have a battle with himself in order to become Super once again. Yes, as we all know, this is an entry that got a lot of criticism upon its release, and it still seems to piss people off to this day. But seriously, is it really that bad? And for every one thing there is to complain about Superman 3, could there be another thing to praise it for? And to be perfectly honest, I find Superman 3 to be a lot better and a lot more easy to digest than some of the rubbish superhero content that we're given these days. But regardless, today we're going to give Superman 3 its just desserts by looking into 10 more things that you didn't know about Superman 3. Yes, this is a follow-up episode to one that I made a few years ago, so I want to check it out. Number 10. Superman 3 went into production before the release of Superman 2. It was 1980, and everyone was eagerly anticipating the follow-up to Superman the movie, Superman 2. Due to the huge buzz surrounding the newfound Superman craze, thanks to the as-mentioned Superman the movie, father and son producers Alexandra and Ilya Solkind, along with Pierre Spengler, announced a third Superman movie at the Cannes Film Festival in May 1980, with Superman 2 not being released until late 1980 and early 1981 in certain parts of the world. So, Superman 3 was actually announced long before the release of Superman 2. That's how confident they were with their newfound success. Superman 2 even ends with the promise that Superman would indeed return in Superman 3. So the Soul Kinds were going to strike while the iron was hot. And milk this super money train to get more of those glorious super dollars. Superman 2 was of course a huge success. It didn't bring in the first movie's box office intake of $300 million, but it was still an impressive $190 million. And the premiere was a huge fun party which no doubt secured Superman's ongoing success. Even Arnold Schwarzenegger was getting in on the action with the Superman celebrations. So with it being clear that the producer should keep the success going, Superman 3 was a sure thing. But all they needed was a script, and that wasn't so easy. Number 9. Potential Superman Replacements so as early as December 1980, Ilya Solkind wrote an early draft for Superman 3. It was kind of a hodgepodge of ideas thrown into a blender in a story involving Supergirl, Brainiac, and Mixapicolic, and it involved a time-traveling showdown in the Middle Ages. Yeah, look, I won't go into it too much, as I already went into it in the previous video. But needless to say, no one really liked this script. Most of all was Superman actor Christopher Reeve himself. He pretty much said that he did not want to star in the movie. So other Superman potentials were considered, including Kurt Russell, Jeff Bridges, and John Travolta, but none of them wanted to do it. With filming set to begin, the production panicked and cast Tony Danza as Superman. But Superman 3's director Richard Lester really did not like this bit of casting and thought that the movie was destined for failure. So he pleaded with Reeve to return. And so Reeve did, provided that the script goes through changes. And so, for better or worse, husband and wife writing team Leslie and David Newman came on board to make the rewrites. They had previously done script work at some capacity on the previous two Superman movies, and David Newman co-wrote the script for Bonnie and Clyde. Number 8. Superman 3 was nearly sold off to another production company. Yeah, it seems that Superman 3 was off to a real bumpy start. 
Due to the tiring costs of making Superman movies, the Solkinds wondered if it was even worth forking out all the cash this time, and apparently considered selling the rights to Italian-American producing giant Dino De Laurentiis, who a few years earlier produced the Flash Gordon movie. But negotiations didn't go anywhere, so the Solkinds stayed on. It seemed that even director Richard Lester wasn't even keen to return either. After directing the remaining scenes that Richard Donner hadn't directed for Superman 2, he kind of felt like he was done with it, as he felt that he didn't direct comic book movies. But he did decide to return and take on the job when he heard the news that Richard Pryor was cast in the movie. And so considering he really wanted to work with Pryor, he took on the job, and so the production headed to Calgary, Alberta, Canada, to film exterior scenes and Pinewood Studios near London for set filming, with some filming also taking place at Glen Canyon, Utah for good measure. It feels like a lot of this movie was actually filmed in Canada. Yet yeah, this time Superman is fighting for truth, justice and the Canadian A's. Number 7. Original choice to play the villain. When it came to the movie's main villain, Ross Webster, the greedy businessman who is seeking more wealth by any destructive means possible, the part was played by Robert Vaughn, who at that stage was probably best known for The Man From U.N.C.L.E. and The Magnificent Seven. Even though he's very charming and charismatic, I never found him to be a real threat to Superman. Not so much a super villain, but more of a super pest. You know, he's kind of an annoyance. Interestingly, Ilya Solkind's original choice for the part was Frank Langella. Ilya liked Langella in the 1979 Dracula movie, where, well, he played Dracula. And he thought that he would add more mystery to the character. But the casting didn't work out, probably because at that stage Langella wasn't a big name yet. Ilya further felt that Robert Vaughn may have been a little too famous for the part. I actually really do like Robert Vaughn, and I kind of get Roger Moore vibes off him, be that American Roger Moore. However, I do think that Langella could have been really threatening and menacing. After all, when he played Skeletor a few years later, he absolutely aced it. Number 6. More Than Just Supervillains It seems common knowledge that the evil computer in Superman 3 is kind of like a theatrical version of Brainiac, which makes sense as in the script, the original Brainiac idea was condensed down to the supercomputer. A lot of fans claim that evil Superman is kind of like a theatrical version of the character Bizarro. Now I really don't think that's true, as I think the producers were just simply fascinated with exploring the dark side of Superman, not necessarily Bizarro. However, one thing I will admit is that in the movie we see Superman's costume darken when he becomes bad. However, after the release of Superman 3, the Bizarro character's costume would also darken, looking familiar to the evil Superman costume. And it's a look that the character has still to this day. So could it be that Superman 3 influenced an iconic Superman villain? Well, it goes further than that. Something else I've noticed a lot of people say is that Ross Webster is just a low-grade Lex Luthor. You know, like a Gene Hackman substitute. Now, I personally don't agree with this. In the previous movies, Lex Luthor was an underground criminal who had to hide out as the police were hunting him. Ross Webster is out and in the open. He's a successful business entrepreneur and is well respected. In fact, I can't help but feel that after Superman 3, the Lex Luthor character was more molded after the Ross Webster character. As before Superman 3, Lex Luthor in the comics was an evil mad scientist. Whereas after Superman 3, the Crisis of Infinite Earths took place, where the Superman comics were rebooted. And Lex Luthor was now a well-respected entrepreneur industrialist who is in charge of a tech company, just like Ross Webster. In Superman 3, Webster has Websco, and in the later Superman comics, Luthor has LexCorp, both high-tech companies and both villains have tall, extravagant skyscrapers that act as a monument to their egotistical hubris. And so this idea of Lex Luthor secretly being an evil businessman while having the city's respect as the owner of a respected, high-tech corporation has actually stuck around ever since. So could it be that Superman 3 shaped Superman's most iconic supervillain? Hmm. Number 5. Actor Quirks Superman 3 was a big step upwards for Christopher Reeve, as it was the first time he got top billing for a Superman movie. The first movie went to Marlon Brando, and the second went to Gene Hackman. 
Reeve also looks like he's in the prime of his physical health in Superman 3. He looks great this time round. And he also seems to be sprouting some amazing super follicles. However, Superman's hair in Superman 3, unlike the previous two movies, isn't Reeves' real hair. But in fact, he had to wear a hairpiece, as the actor suffered alopecia, which is a common condition that sadly affects a lot of people. But regardless, he still is rocking that wig. Now, Richard Pryor was cast in the movie not too long after his fire accident, where 80% of his body was burnt. Because of this, according to the producers, when filming Superman 3, Pryor was still in a bit of a weakened condition, and so for some of his more physical scenes, a stunt double was used. Now, there are also some stories floating around out there that while making Superman 3, Pryor was really under the influence of... Well, let's just say party substances. But you know what? I don't know. I wasn't there. His character, Gus Gorman, was an entirely an original character, written specifically for Superman 3. And you know what? I find him to be a lot of fun. Maybe not laugh out loud funny, but still very enjoyable. And I was delighted to see Gus Gorman get a cameo in the Superman 78 comic. Annette O'Toole played Lana Lang, a popular character from the comics, who was Superman's high school sweetheart. She was actually really delighted to take on the role, as she loved the comics. She said that when it came to Superman 3, she spent most of the time filming with Christopher Reeve as Clark Kent, but when she acted with him as Superman, it was kind of like Reeve had left the building, and that he actually was Superman, as he just embodied the character so much. I mean, look at him, the guy is Superman. And as we all know, she would go on to play Martha Kent in the Smallville TV series. The Lorelei character, who is Webster's uh, protege, I guess, who also seduces evil Superman, was played by Australian New Zealand comedian and actress Pamela Stevenson. At that time, she had just starred in a very successful British comedy sketch show called Not the Nine O'Clock News, alongside other comedians, including Rowan Atkinson. She would actually go on to marry Billy Connolly and would later become a clinical psychologist. Ross Webster's sister Vera was played by Annie Ross, and she had had a long successful career as a jazz singer. And several sources claim that she even voiced the character of Ursa for Superman 2. Number 4. Posters so there were two main posters used to promote Superman 3, one that focused on the comedy aspect of the movie, and the other one which had more of a serious tone. Now I like this one of Superman flying over the Grand Canyon with a comically terrified Richard Pryor. It lets you know right away that this is going to be a slightly different Superman movie. However, there's something about Reeves' face, it just doesn't look right to me. The darker, serious one is fun too, as it shows Superman bursting through a wall of computers with Gus Gorman looking quite concerned. Superman definitely looks more dynamic here, and it actually does look like a Superman movie. It's just that Superman and Gus Gorman don't really take up much poster space, and don't really stand out. I mean, is it just me, or does Superman look a bit tiny? But I do still prefer this poster. But I can understand the other poster being promoted more, as producer P.S. Bengler said that when they knew Richard Pryor was going to be in the movie, they knew that they had to go for a more comical approach. There was also this lesser known Superman 3 poster, which shows Superman battling Supercomputer. And yeah, look, it looks fine. It is visually interesting. I just think that's a really awkward angle of Superman is all. In 2006, when Superman 3 got a deluxe DVD release, we got this cover and I really didn't like it. I didn't think it was very well put together. It looks kind of, you know, cut and paste. Firstly, this shot of Clark Kent opening up his shirt to reveal his Superman S just doesn't look right, it just doesn't sit there properly. Yes, it is a scene from the most iconic moment in the movie, but it just looks kind of awkward here, and I don't really like the green glow in the background. And for some reason, Gus Gorman is absent from the characters at the bottom. Now this just baffles me as Superman 3 is known as the Richard Pryor Superman. Why would you not have Richard Pryor on the cover? Regardless, I'm happy that for a recent 4K steelbook release, they've maintained the original mainstream poster. Number 3. Deleted Ideas and Storyboards So most fans would know that there are a string of deleted scenes that were added to Superman 3's TV broadcasts. Now I grew up with a taped recording from a TV broadcast of Superman 3. 
of which I watched the hell out of that tape. But in doing so, I had become accustomed to all the deleted scenes, which back then I obviously didn't know were deleted. And oddly, it's still jarring now watching current releases without these scenes. It just doesn't feel right to me because I was just so used to watching them as a kid. However, there are even more deleted material that you can find if you dig deep enough. P.S. Bengler said that the fire at the chemical plant at the beginning was going to go on much longer and there was going to be greater stakes involved, as the fire was going to have burnt half of Alaska, but the budget cost to film this was too much, and he also felt that the scene just would have gone on for too long, so it was trimmed down to what we actually see on screen. I find going through the storyboards to be an interesting experience as they give you alternative views and takes on certain scenes, and some of them even have additional dialogue that didn't end up in the final film. One interesting shot is Superman spinning someone around really fast. An example of the added dialogue comes from the guy that Superman saves from drowning in his car, where he thanked Superman for saving his life, of which Superman replied, That's alright, I was on my way to work anyway. <laughs> It's like, yeah, I may as well have saved you. I mean, look, I was in town, I was on my way, so, you know, what the heck? <laughs> now, I think we can all agree that the scene where Vera turns into the robot woman is a pretty terrifying scene. Well, if you can believe it, in the original storyboards, she looked even more terrifying. Seriously, what's with that? Imagine if she looked like this in the final film. Yeah, that would have been pretty badass, actually. Number two, novelization. On the topic of deleted material, then there's the novelization which was written by novelist William Coswinkle, who previously wrote the novelization for E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Now, the novelization featured a ton of things that were not featured in the final film, like a sequence where evil Superman uses cloud formation to write swear words in the sky. The novel even sets up quite early on in the story a, a sort of lead up and build up to evil Superman. As due to internal dialogue, it seems that Superman was already quite frustrated with being Superman and often wishes he could unleash his superpowers in order to teach people a lesson. I mean, you really can't blame him. In the scene where Superman saves the chemical workers by having them slide down the pipe, they start thinking about ways that they can sue Superman. So this Superman is actually quite an annoyed run down version. And there is a sense that Superman is rebelling. And I think that we're led to believe that this is why he was so easily led astray by the tar kryptonite. You know, it finally allowed him to succumb to all these thoughts. Ah, uh, yeah, look, I don't like it. Christopher Reeves as Superman was kind and noble, and he would never act out of revenge or vengeance or even frustration. Maybe it was felt that an extra explanation was needed for Superman going evil. But listen, there's no need to overcomplicate it. Just keep it as the kryptonite did it. Otherwise, you're kind of putting into question Superman's character, and that's just not right. It's also explained in the book that when Superman's evil, his suit goes fully black and that he has green glowing eyes, making evil Superman actually sound quite ghoulish. Also in the novelization, there is more of a backstory about Ross and Vera Webster's childhoods. We also learn that Vera Webster has extremely bad breath, and there's a scene where after the high school reunion, Brad is so drunk, he throws up. <laughs> Yeah, there are actually tons of stuff featured in the book that wasn't in the movie. Now often novelizations of movies do tend to be based on early scripts of the movies that they are based on. But it's hard to tell what comes from the original script and what parts Coswinkle may have actually been improvising. Number one, it wasn't as much of a flop as people claim it to be. Superman 3 flew onto the big screen in June 1983 in the UK and July of that year in the US. It made just over $80 million on a $39 million budget, which was quite a dramatic drop from Superman 2's box office intake of $190 million, and even more of a drop after Superman the movie's intake of $300 million. And the film got trashed a lot by the critics. Leonard Moulton labelled it as, quote, an appalling sequel that trashed everything that Superman was about for the sake of cheap laughs and a co-starring role for Richard Pryor. A great deal of the criticism was placed on the movie's more comedic elements, Richard Lester's directing, and Richard Pryor's performance. 
and Superman 3 was nominated for two Razzies, one for Worst Score and the other for Worst Supporting Actor for Richard Pryor. And both Christopher Reeve and Richard Pryor apparently really didn't like the final movie. However, producer Elia Solkind has always maintained that despite popular belief, the movie was not a failure but a success. He claimed that the movie did still get great praise and it was still considered as financially successful. It was, after all, the 12th highest grossing movie of 1983. And I guess you've also got to take into account that at that time there was tough competition in the box office, with the likes of Return of the Jedi and Jaws 3D, both of whom were also third entry franchise movies. Not to mention you also had the Battle of the Bonds going on with Octopussy and Never Say Never Again. So it was always going to be a bumpy ride to release the movie at that time. I kind of appreciate how Elia has always defended Superman 3, and always claimed that Superman 3 at least tries to do something different, rather than just repeating the same thing all over again, and maintains that he just wanted to make a fun movie, and feels that he did just that. And I kind of agree. It's not Superman 1 and 2 all over again, and it does take a lot of guts to try and do something different with a winning formula. Now, I'm not agreeing with absolutely everything he says. After all, in the Superman 3 DVD commentary, he talks about the scene where the two traffic light men come to life and start beating each other up, where he says, and I'm not kidding, something to the effect of, well, who can prove me that that wouldn't happen in real life? You know, basically saying, we don't know the full extent of technology, maybe that might happen. No! Oh dear God, no! But I do appreciate that he has stuck up for the movie that he's made, and he does seem to be proud of it. In later years, Superman 3 got a not so good reputation, and shrugged off with people saying that, you know, it sucks. I also feel that Superman 3 often gets paired off with Superman 4, as being two Superman films that, well, weren't very super. But to be honest, I love Superman 3, and I get a lot of enjoyment out of it. It's the first movie I can remember watching, which was from that TV recording that I previously spoke about. And I just loved it so much, and I just got so engulfed by the movie's universe, and I would just watch it over and over again. This is the film that got me into movies, as well as the magical and fantastical nature of movies. It really lit a spark in my imagination as far as possibilities in the arts of storytelling and the endless boundaries of fantasy drama. So for that, I will always love Superman 3. Yes, it's not perfect, and it does have some silly slapstick humour. But then again, so do a lot of the modern Marvel movies, but they seem to get praised for their wacky, cringy humour, so figure that one out. Gladly, there do still seem to be other fans of Superman 3, as it was referenced in Office Space, and director Edgar Wright has also spoken positively about Superman 3. All in all, I find Superman 3 to be a really fun movie. Seriously, I find this movie to be so much fun. Maybe I have a nostalgia love for it, because when you're a kid and you watch Superman 3, you don't think, well, the first one was better because it felt more mature and had better cinematography and how the box of Cheerios were carefully placed on the table, blah, blah, blah. No, you just go into it looking for enjoyment. But my childhood aside, I do still think of Superman 3 as an enjoyable guilty pleasure. I look at it as being like the James Bond movie Moonraker, in that yes, it's utterly ridiculous and kinda becomes a joke onto itself, but damn it if the movie isn't a good time and has a good heart. I think the best way to go into Superman 3 is to not go into it with the mind frame of Superman the movie, but instead Moonraker. And then I think it would be easier to understand the movie and what the movie was trying to do. Anyway, I'm Minty. And hopefully one day Superman 3 would get the recognition that I think it deserves and to finally get out of this popular to pick on limbo that it seems to be stuck in. But if not, meh, I still love it. See ya!